Good day. Let's pray as we look at 2 Corinthians 4 together. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we open your word. Give us understanding into your scriptures, but also give us understanding into our own hearts, our own attitudes, our own desires. Please prompt us and move us by your word to trust you and to keep on persevering in love for you and love for others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul uh, is sharing with us his temptation to lose heart. Uh, life has been a struggle. It's been a struggle for him. We've seen that in chapter 1. He's brought to the point of death itself, and he despairs even of life. But he learns that in his despair he can trust God. In chapter 2, we see the difficulties that he has when he's cut off from Titus. Uh, in chapter 4, he talks about being hard-pressed on every side, crushed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, given over to death. In chapter 6, that we'll look at in a couple of weeks' time, he talks about enduring and troubles and hardships and distress and beatings and imprisonments and riots and hard work and sleepless nights, hunger and sorrowful and poor. See, life for Paul is hard. Uh, his work is hard, his ministry is hard. There is so much up against him and he struggles within and he struggles without. And I reckon that we probably know something of his struggle, maybe for different reasons. Our whole world at the moment is struggling. It's perplexed. It's feeling overwhelmed. People are on the verge of giving up in so many areas of life. We're constantly seeing advertisements for mental health such that we've never seen before. People are encouraged not to live in anxiety, not to wallow in their despair, but to seek help, to reach out to others. And maybe you're among those who've done that. You've just been finding life overwhelming, too difficult uh, to be coping with family and work and the pressure of illness and everything else going on around about. And I think it's really put everything under strain, strain to our relationships within our own families, maybe with people at church, maybe with others in the community. It's put pressure on us uh, as a church. How do we go about meeting together? What do we do? Uh, what's it like to meet online? It's not quite the same, is it? And what do we do for people who can't concentrate online? How do we reach out and encourage families in ministry to their own children? And what about those who are elderly, who are unable to meet together, uh, or perhaps who are concerned about the health risks in doing so? You see, this year we're seeing an intensification of all the pressures that weigh upon us just simply for being alive. What we're seeing now is everybody experiencing some things that we'll all experience sometimes, but it's just crushing in and it all seems to be happening uh, together at the same time. We know from Scripture that being a Christian is hard. Uh, it's not an easy option. And if we choose to take a stand for being a Christian, then we'll likely be cut down. In today's cancel culture, uh, to stand up and say what you believe and not to give in to the prevailing uh, kind of cultural climate puts you at great risk. Great risk of losing friends, losing business, uh, sometimes uh, even, even losing opportunities uh, to continue to do the things that you live for. Well, ministry is hard, and if we're serious about church, if we're serious about people gathering together, that makes it difficult at this time. If we want to see people become Christians, and we want to reach out and pop our heads above the parapet, so to speak, and own up to being Christian and encourage others to follow Christ, that will be hard too. Well, the Apostle Paul knows this. He's experienced this. He's hard-pressed on every side, but he says he's not crushed. He's not given up. It's easy to give up, easy to retreat, easy to take off and do our own thing, but Paul doesn't. Have a look at verse 1. He says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And he finishes this chapter with the same words. Down in verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Paul doesn't lose heart. He keeps on going. Why? 
What pushes Paul forward? Why doesn't he give up? What is the reason behind him not losing heart? Because if he doesn't lose heart, with all that he's going through, perhaps there's hope for you and I that we won't lose heart either. Well, there are three reasons that I want to focus on uh, for Paul not losing heart. The first is that God is responsible for ministry. The second is that God works in weakness. And the third is that God guarantees our future. So first of all then, let's look at what it means for God to be responsible for ministry. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. See, Paul has the, has the, has the ministry that he has because of the mercy of God. It's been given to him by God. It's not something that Paul has created for himself. He's not a self-made minister. No, he was plucked from opposition and brought into relationship with Jesus. And Jesus has given him the public uh, role of proclaiming Christ among the Gentiles. It is God's ministry, not Paul's. Paul has received his ministry from God. And he knows that he is therefore involved in something that is God's responsibility. It's only the mercy of God that means that he's involved. It's not up to Paul. Everything doesn't depend upon Paul. Paul is not the one responsible for making people Christians. Paul's not responsible for building churches, for growing attendance, for developing programs, for changing lives. That is God's work. It's God's work through God's word, by God's spirit, that makes it God's responsibility, the work of ministry. And friends, that is liberating to know that. If we are to be involved in the work of Christian ministry, then we must realize first and foremost that we are just, by God's mercy, taking a place in what God has responsibility for. God is the one who will make this happen. Look at verse 2, because it has implications for how Paul goes about his ministry. He says, Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways, We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Now, if ministry was up to Paul, you could imagine that he could uh, have all kinds of strategies. If he was responsible for leading people to become Christian, if he was responsible for growing the church, if he was responsible for getting more and more numbers of people to come and to follow Jesus Christ, then I'd imagine that he would probably be tempted to explore all kinds of strategies. In this day and age, maybe build up the hype somewhat, get some momentum going, get some social media presence, uh, put on a bit of a show, make it impressive, maybe give incentives for people to become a part of this church, maybe log on here and you come... Uh, with a chance to win a certain amount of cash or, or supplies or books or resources, songs, music and so on, maybe you'd appeal to people's inner felt needs. Maybe there'd be a kind of bait and switch thing, you know. Uh, discover the greatest thing that this world has never seen before. Come to Salt Church on Sunday afternoons and people get there and they see us. Well, friends, there are all kinds of strategies that people have been tempted to use and sadly do use in order to make ministry work, to make ministry grow, uh, to get in the numbers, to build the money, to build the empire, it seems. But Paul is not in for any of that. No, what he does is quite simply preach the message plainly. He doesn't use any underhand tactics. There's no bait and switch for the Apostle Paul. Because Paul wants a ministry that's about spiritual transformation, not just numbers. If it was just numbers, you could do cash giveaways, but he wants real change. He wants people to come to know that they have a relationship with God through Christ. Look, look at the uh, situation that he's got a minister in. Verse 4, you see, the reality is that the God of this age, a way of speaking about the devil, Satan, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You see, it is Satan's work to veil the truth to people. 
you and I can't remove the veil. It's not something that we're capable of doing. But as we preach Christ Jesus as Lord, God removes the veil. Verse 5, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. You see, Paul preaches Christ because it's in seeing Christ that we come to see God. As we put our trust in Jesus as our Lord and our Saviour, so the veil is lifted off our eyes and we can come to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. And that is the wonder of the gospel. God brings about a new creation. The language here, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, it takes us back, doesn't it, to Genesis chapter 1. God speaks and the world comes into existence. Now through the gospel, God speaks as we proclaim Christ and people are brought into life, new life, spiritual life for all eternity. This is the wonder of the ministry that Paul has and he's not ultimately responsible for it. God is. And that is a powerful encouragement. And friends, I think it's an encouragement to us as well. Those of us who are parents know the challenges and something of the heartache that there is in wanting our kids to have the absolute best in life. And friends, the best in life doesn't mean sporting prowess or the greatest education or, or being well set up financially or having a great home, a great future, even marrying the right person and having a wonderful family to give us grandkids, as great as all those things might be. No, if our kids are to have the best in life, then they need to come to understand and to put their trust in the Lord Jesus. And yet we know that that's not something that we can control. We can't control whether our children will be Christian or not Christian. We can't control whether they'll follow Jesus or whether they'll go off on a pathway of their own. But God is responsible for ministry to our children. And he just calls us to be faithful, to pass on the message of Jesus, to help our children to understand what it is that grips us, what we believe. And so we live and so we speak in order to honour Jesus. And we ask God to be at work in our children. We just simply are called to teach the truth plainly and to live it out in our lives. And to pray that God will transform those in our families. And our friends, it's not about clever arguments. It's not that you've got to have the absolute knockdown uh, apologetic so that your friend has no recourse. Uh, that they're finally defeated and that they've got no further opposition as if it's just about defeating arguments. No, friends, it's, it's not about clever arguments. It's not about brilliant rhetoric. It's not about pinning someone into a corner. It's, but it's simply about making known the truth, opening it up, making it clear, backing that up with our lives, trusting in God and asking God to be at work in them. In our little church at Salt, um, if it was up to us to grow this church, to see hundreds of people become Christians, to see families uh, flocking in, to see children and youth programs bursting at the seams, then we would probably be tempted to try every trick in the book to compete with the other uh, challenges that are around us, to compete with social media and and people's peer groups, and maybe even what some of the big churches with their razzmatazz programs are doing. But friends, it's not up to us. It's God's business, and we can trust God to be at work, even at Salt Community Church. Let me share something personal. Over the last few years, I've been tempted to think that it's up to me to be leaving a legacy. Up to me in these last years of my life, however many they may be, and I thought they'd be over by now, to actually make a difference, to really get focused and energetic and work hard for God, to make sure that I'm able to influence people to the max of my ability. And I can tell you I've got stressed and I've been driven and I've made mistakes and I've done damage to relationships, I've done damage to my health, and I've thought that it's been up to me. 
And the reminder of this passage is, no, it's not up to me. This is God's ministry. He's not calling me to leave a legacy. He's encouraging me to trust in him. And as we trust in him, we will not lose heart. Secondly, Paul reminds us in this passage that God works in weakness. Do you feel weak at times, inadequate, that you're not up to it, that it's all too hard? Well, so did Paul. And in fact, it's only when we start to feel like that and recognize that that is the truth, that we are weak and inadequate, that we become useful to God. Uh, now, of course, God can work in us and through us in whatever way he pleases. But the reality is we see right through scripture that God's chosen means, his modus operandi, if you like, is to work through weakness. Um, let's have a look at what he says here. Verse 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You see, God is not limited by our weakness. God actually delights in using us in our weakness because that brings him glory, not us. And he's God, not us. Now look at verses 8 and 9. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. See, as Paul follows the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is hammered on every side, he actually sees God at work. God works through that weakness. And when you think about it, how does God save the world? Well, he does so through his son Jesus hanging on a cross, paying the price for our sin. Our rebellion against God is being dealt with. God is pouring out his punishment upon Jesus so that we can be saved. God at work through the weakness of the cross. And it doesn't get any weaker than that. And so Paul writes that he carries around the death of Jesus so that God, the life of Jesus will also be revealed. In verse 11, For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. See, we have a ministry of weakness. Our message is the cross of Jesus Christ. And who are we? Well, we're frail, pathetic, weak people with a weak methodology of simply making the truth about Jesus plain and a weak message, Christ crucified. But let's go back to verse 7 for a minute. Why is it that he says we have this treasure in jars of clay? What, what does it mean to have the treasure? And what is the treasure, this treasure? Well, the immediate reference probably goes back to verse 6, where he speaks about the light shining in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Christ. That is our treasure. And the light that we have is in a clay jar. And it needs to get out. Let me take you back uh, to something which may well lie behind Paul's thoughts. I don't know for sure, but I give it to you because I think it's worth seeing what God does on this circumstance. And I'll take you back to the book of Judges and Gideon. Gideon, you might be remember, is the guy who tossed out a fleece uh, to try and work out how to avoid what God was asking him to do. Uh, and he's overwhelmed by the responsibility because Israel had been absolutely overrun by the Midianites and they are a big force. Now, God wants Gideon uh, to rise up against the Midianites and so to gather an army. And Gideon's able to gather 32,000 men to fight the Midianites. And God says, no, that's too many. <laughs> How can it be too many? Well, it's too many because if you win, you'll boast in your military performance. So God has a plan. He says, I'm going to thin out this group. What I want you to do is say, if anyone's scared, put up their hand and 22,000 put up their hand. They can go home. So they're down to 10,000. God says, oh, that's still too many. I want you to go down to the water and I'm going to get you to look at how people uh, drink water. 
And those who kneel down and drink the water, and others will pick it in their hands and they'll lap it like a dog. And then he says, I want you to choose those who lap it like a dog. So the dog lappers, how many of them were there? 300, great. The dog lappers, they're your army. 300 dog lappers to beat the Midianites. You see, God chooses weakness. He separates them into a small group and a pathetic group at that. And then he gives them their fighting strategy. They're to take clay jars and they're to put a lamp in the jar and they're to take a trumpet that they can make a great noise. And when they get into the Midianite camp, they're going to smash the jars and the light will come out and they'll blow their trumpets and we can read about the victory that takes place. How was it a victory? Because God made it so. And it might well be that Paul has that in mind, that God is going to work through a clay jar, through something as weak and pathetic as that story of Gideon to bring about a powerful work of salvation. God works through weakness. And thirdly, in this wonderful chapter, we see that Paul doesn't despair. He doesn't give up. He doesn't lose heart because God guarantees our future. Now, he's getting hammered, as we've seen, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and it's not getting any easier. And I wonder how you're feeling as well. It doesn't get easier, does it? We, we feel the, the pain and the struggle of long-term perseverance as Christians. Now, let me, let me tell you, I had a birthday this week, and birthdays for me are, well, they're a, they're a bittersweet experience. Uh, they are extraordinary sweet because I didn't think I'd see any more birthdays. My 50th, I thought, would probably be my last. I would just turn 58. But they're also a reminder to me that I'm getting slower and weaker and more frail and more forgetful than I was the year before. But it's easy to be overwhelmed. Sometimes I just feel like curling up and going to sleep. But I can't. And I won't. Why? Because I believe in Jesus. And I believe that Jesus matters. And so I speak. As we see with the Apostle Paul. Verse 13. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Now it's a strange quote. Well, strange to make this quote, because it seems like he's just saying something really straightforward. He says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. And the danger, if you're like me, is you skip over quotes. But here is a quote. It is written, he says. And we should go back and see why Paul is referencing what is Psalm 116. And if you go back to Psalm 116, you discover some interesting things. Now, it's a quote from verse 10 from your footnotes will tell you the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's a little harder to pick up from the English, which tends to be translated from the Hebrew. But in Psalm 116, I'll give you the context of what's going on. Back in, uh, in verse 3, he says, The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. And then if we read on a little bit further, he says, Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. And the Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. And the Lord protects the unweary. And when I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone is a liar. You see, in Psalm 116, the psalmist is overwhelmed to the point of wanting to give up. He is at the point of death itself. He's exhausted, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and he just wants to return to rest. But, he says, I have believed, so I speak. Paul believes, so he speaks. And if we know the truth of salvation through Christ, 
No matter what's going on around about us, we will want others to know that truth as well. And so we will speak. We will continue and not lose heart. During this week, I watched a video, which I'm going to encourage you to have a look at as well. You'll find it on the the Point Community Church website. It's from a young woman, a young mother in the church called Chrissy. Chrissy has been struggling with blood cancer for a number of months now. And uh, it's got to the point where chemotherapy is damaging her heart and there's no further treatment options for her. And so she's going into palliative care. As she speaks on this video, she encourages us not to worry for her. She understands that we'll be fearful. She understands that it will hurt and that we'll be concerned for children and for her husband and that we'll probably be concerned for ourselves. But she says, don't worry about me. She says it's kind of like I've booked a holiday and I don't know when it's going to happen, but it'll be soon and I can't wait to be on that holiday. She sees it as a spiritual graduation that she's looking forward to. It might be weeks, it might be months, it might be days. Who knows, in God's mercy, it may be years. But one day she will go to be with God. And friends, we know that reality too. And so we don't need to give up. We don't need to lose heart. We can gain perspective. Look at verse 16 back in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need the perspective of the scriptures. We need the perspective of Paul. We need spiritual perspective. Life is hard, absolutely. But it's so important that we realize that this hard life is ultimately a momentary trouble. That our suffering is temporary and that we look forward to an inheritance with God that is eternal. Friends, we won't remember that in the difficulties and the struggles and the trials of life if all we do is watch the news. We won't remember it if we are wallowing on our lounges, doing nothing but binging on Netflix. We won't remember it if we're just hanging out with friends complaining about life. Now, we need to open the scriptures. We need to get together with fellow believers. We need to be reminded in our churches, in our ministries, that God is at work and what he's doing will make a difference for all eternity. And so to speak, so to keep going, so to speak up for what we believe. Sadly, we see churches that have given in to the message of this age. One prominent author with thousands in his church and millions of dollars in his accounts and a huge influence around the world has written a book recently called Your Best Life Now. And I want to say, garbage. Absolute nonsense. No, it's not your best life now. No, now is for suffering. It's for pain. It's hard and there'll be struggle. But we don't despair. We don't lose heart. Because our best life is yet to come. I wonder what God is teaching us during this pandemic. Maybe he's calling us to trust only in him. And not to trust in our glitz and glamour, our size and numbers, our dollars and programs and and our power or our coolness. Not to think that it's about what we do. To stop trusting in ourselves. To remember that God's means has always been to work through broken pots. And so to keep looking on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal.